Well, good morning and welcome to St. Mark's Community Church. I just barely got my mic on right there. I was about to give Garrett a hard time about it and then literally forgot to turn it on until right that moment. Uh, But more regularly than telling me to turn the mic on, uh, you should be on the production team because you also get to flash messages on the back of the screen to tell me to hurry up and get off the stage. Um, So, hey, I'm so uh, thankful to be with y'all today as we continue to explore um, the focuses for our mission as a church here. Uh, and, and, and specifically looking at modeling those mission focuses off of Jesus' missional heart as we see in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, today, they're not going to need to tell me to get off the stage because we got kind of a little sermonette because uh, we're going to have a chance uh, really to spend most of our time this morning uh, sharing with our mission partner to Ukraine, uh, Vitaly Smolin. And I love having Vitaly in town because he always brings gifts with him, uh, like this lovely shirt here, or maybe a box of chocolates or, or, or some sort of ornate uh, plate. But, but also, I love having him here because uh, he just has a remarkable story of being faithful to God's leading in his life and, and really displaying that missional heart that, that I hope we as a congregation continue to cultivate in our own lives. Uh, today, we're just going to be scratching the surface uh, of his ministry and his mission to Ukraine. Uh, and I would love to encourage you all to come out tomorrow night uh, from 6.30 to 8. There's child care for our, one of our missional Mondays uh, because it's going to be a chance to hear more stories about what it has looked like to serve God uh, in, in a war-torn nation over these past two years. We're also going to have a chance to hear from some of our other mission partners. And the reason I think it's so important to be there is, A, yes, we're going to grow in our own faith, but also it's a chance for us as a congregation to to show up and and to support uh, our mission partners uh, and to encourage them and pray for them as they continue to serve God each and every day in some of the most difficult environments. Uh, So let's go ahead and open up today into Luke chapter 5. It's a a story that we've heard many times before, but but as usual, we're going to ask ourselves uh, to put ourselves in a different position to put ourselves in a different perspective, to imagine ourselves in this story. So as I read these words, consider who you might be uh, in, in the crowd that gathers around Jesus. One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now we're going to pause here uh, for a little bit before we witness a a, a miracle that we have heard many times before. And we're going to pause and, and recognize that there are three different groups of people that are gathered here and engaging with Jesus. And each of them are coming for a different purpose. Each of them are experiencing Jesus in a different way. And each of them are also creating barriers that keep others from experiencing Jesus. And so as we read their story and we consider their posture, I want to challenge us to consider ourselves in that same light, to ask how we are engaging with Jesus, why we're engaging with Jesus, and also importantly, who we might be keeping from our Savior. The first uh, group of people that are gathered there with Jesus is, is quite simply put, the crowd. This is probably the group of people that we're most familiar with. It's it's, it's a group of of nondescript folks that have heard that this traveling rabbi is going to be in their town, Capernaum. Now, now one of the things that I think is important to remember as we study uh, this story is that Capernaum is not a big city. No, Capernaum is this small, intimate town. In fact, I've said this before, all of Capernaum would fit on the St. Mark's Community Church campus, from the ball field to the parking lot over there. It was a community of of fishermen and and blue-collar folks. And, And suddenly, they are blessed with Jesus, the miraculous teacher, entering into their city, into their little town, 
spending a night in, in, in one of the locals' homes and teaching and healing there. As he stood in that home, it's no wonder that the crowds came out. Why did they come out? How did they hear? Because the town is too small not to have heard. They know that Jesus is here right in their village. This is probably one of the biggest things to happen in Capernaum for as long as they can remember. In fact, for generations of people. And so they come out in droves. I imagine that every home is empty in Capernaum this night to be able to have a chance to hear this radical teacher, to witness this miraculous healer. But here's the thing. The homes at Capernaum are humble just like the people. The homes in Capernaum are, are, are one room. Not one bedroom, one room. And they probably only fit 10 to 12 folks standing shoulder to shoulder together. And so as we hear that Jesus is teaching in a home, we recognize that there's probably only the disciples, maybe a few other close followers that could, could enter into the space with him. The rest were gathered outside in the streets, crowding around this home, leaning in, hoping to catch just a snippet of what Jesus is saying. They are so focused on their experience of Jesus, on, on that leaning in posture that they miss something important. A man has been brought on his mat. He's paralyzed. And because Capernaum is so small, he's, he's probably familiar with all the people in the crowd. They all know his name. They probably all know his family. They all know his story. They're familiar with his circumstances. Their hearts have probably been broken for him. And yet the crowd does not make way. And I find myself asking the question, why? Well, this past weekend, I had a chance to, to go up to, to Richmond. Uh, we were going to be cheering on a group of our friends who were running in the Richmond Half Marathon in honor of one of our dear friends who passed away about a year ago. This was going to be a memorial of sorts, a celebration. And you'll notice that I said I was cheering on. I was not actually running. Uh, maybe those days are behind me. I don't know. Uh, but we came out uh, and, and lined the streets looking for a group of about two dozen runners that were each wearing a special hat with a hydrangea on it. And, and anyone that's been to a marathon to spectate realized that it's like a two-hour live-action Where is Waldo event. Right? There are thousands of people that are constantly moving past you. And there's this certain level of panic you feel as a friend that, that I need to fulfill my ob obligation to cheer these folks on. If I miss it, that's it. There's no second chance. I'm not going to be able to see them again. They probably won't finish the half marathon because they won't have my encouragement. Eh, maybe not quite that. And so you lean in. And, and I found myself just straining my eyes to look for each of these runners that passed by uh, so that I could recognize them from a distance. I could alert the other people around me and, and, and I could cheer them on. Well, there's this one particular spot that I knew a number of my friends would be coming past uh, during this, this block of time. And so I was really hyper-focused on the race. I was really leaning in, looking down the street, and I realized after five or six minutes that I had no awareness of anything else that was going on around me. I was like slowly inching into the road. Runners were running around me. And, and in that moment, I remembered that I, I had a second responsibility this morning, which was to look after my three-year-old and my six-year-old who were on the street with me. And, and in a panic, I look around and they are nowhere to be found at this moment. And, and as a dad, my, my head goes to the worst case scenario. Uh, but, but fortunately, they were just tucked behind this little group of bushes on a bench uh, playing stickers with each other. So, uh, you know, uh, no harm no foul. But I wonder if this is kind of what's happening here in Capernaum. You see, the crowd is not intending to create a barrier between this, this crippled man and, and his healer, but instead they are so focused on their own personal experience of Jesus that they are oblivious to the needs of those that are around them. They're leaning in, listening so closely, trying to catch every word that Jesus says. And as they lean in, in a well-intended posture, 
they accidentally stand in the way of those that need the healer more. I think this is oftentimes the barrier that we create to missions in our community, to missions in our country, to mission in our world. It's not intentional. It's not malicious. In, in fact, it's, it, it's born out of a well-intended pursuit of our personal experience of Jesus. We're trying to lean in to find the place that, that, that scratches the itch of the kind of music that I like to listen to, the kind of community I like to be a part of, the kind of challenges that I like to hear. And we spend all of our time focused on our personal experience of Jesus that we miss out on opportunities to invite others to his feet as well. You see, I'm thankful that we have a God that enters into personal and intimate relationship with us. But I also recognize that we must be cognizant in our pursuit of Christ to open our posture to invite others in. We must recognize that a part of finding ourselves at the feet of Jesus is having our heart molded in a way that opens us up to others in our community, others in our family, others in our school that desperately need Jesus too. You see, the crowd creates an unintended barrier. But there's another group of folks that create a very intentional barrier. You see, we meet the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And it's important to recognize that, that at this time in the ancient world, it was believed that your external brokenness, your external pain, was indicative of some sort of moral deficiency within you. Simply put, that your sickness was an indicator of your sin. In fact, it's for this reason that in the ancient Jewish culture, cripples and those that were blind were not permitted to enter into places of worship. They couldn't come into the synagogue. They couldn't come into the temple because their physical ailments were thought to be an indication of their spiritual unworthiness. In fact, there's this really beautiful story that, that many of us have heard about Jesus entering into the, te the, the temple and, and throwing over the tables of the money changers. And, and one of the things that I have missed up until this week is that we don't actually see that the Pharisees are angry about Jesus throwing over the tables of the money changers. Instead, they're angry about who Jesus replaces the money changers with. It says that he drives the money changers out of the temple, and who does he invite in their stead? The blind and the cripples. And he provides healing for them. And immediately after he's invited the blind and the cripple into the temple, it says that the Pharisees were indignant. And so suddenly it starts to make sense. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law are, are, are coming to hear Jesus, this, this rabbi that they've heard stories about. They're, they're coming to try to validate his message. They're coming to try to evaluate his ministry and his mission. They're studying scripture together. And, and when this paralyzed man comes, they create a barrier because they don't believe that he is worthy of being in the presence of the teachers of the law of the rabbis, and of the Pharisees. And in fact, they believe that his presence will pollute the space of worship that they're trying to enter into. You see, the Pharisees excuse their inaction on the basis of their perception that the physical pain of this paralytic is an indication of his moral and spiritual deficiency. And I'm so grateful that we live now in a context where that would never be the case. None of us would ever look at a medical crisis or a cancer diagnosis and, and, and say that that was an indication of the sin of the person afflicted. I am grateful that not one of us in this room would ever make that case. But I'm also convicted that I do this in a slightly more nuanced way. When I consider the plight 
of the homeless, of the refugee, of the victim of physical and sexual abuse. Oftentimes I create stories in my head. Stories in my head of of their behaviors, their habits, their actions that, that somehow have led them to their circumstances. And I create these stories, why? Because it excuses me from action. But I'll tell you that more often than not, when I have sat with those folks that I have stereotyped or stigmatized, I find their stories to be far from the fictional tales that I've made up in my head. I find their stories to be stories of of, of brokenness that I have never had to face in my life. And I find my heart softened to empathy because I recognize they're in front of me. Not just a statistic, but instead a child of God, a creation that desperately needs restoration with the Creator. Look, there are going to be times in which there are certainly folks whose habits, addictions, or behaviors directly correlate to the experience that they have. But here's the thing. We have given our lives to a God whose gospel is founded on unconditional love, is built upon grace and mercy that we are not deserving. And if we claim to follow that Savior, if we claim to have that spirit indwelling within us, then there is no behavior, no habit, no addiction that excuses our inaction, that excuses our silence, that excuses our invitation into the restoration of our God. And so if we find ourselves in that position, may we consider what it means to dwell upon the unconditional love of our God in a way that, again, opens a door so that creator and creation can have a restored relationship. You see, there's a final group of folks that find themselves in this crowd. It's a group that we've spent most of our Sunday school lessons elevating, and, and, and rightfully so. I want to pause here for a moment uh, to to make sure that we know that that the bold faith of the friends is what has led to the healing of the paralyzed man. I want to recognize that, that indeed we are called to overcome barriers in order to bring folks into a true encounter of Jesus Christ. But I also want to pause for a moment and ask ourselves if perhaps those friends were missing the broader picture of what Jesus was trying to do. Now, I don't know about you, but for whatever reason, when I picture this story, I see on the outside a very small, humble home. But somehow, as if some sort of third dimension they enter into, or fourth dimension, they enter into the home, and now it's this cavernous worship center. Right There are hundreds of people that have gathered around Jesus, and, and he's standing there with, with, with some, some stage lighting. There's this nice space around him. And, and, and then these friends, they begin lowering the paralytic through the roof on some sort of complicated belay system. And, and, and he comes down, he's laid at the feet of Jesus, and there's this powerful moment where the piano begins to underscore, and everyone leans in, and Jesus heals him. But the reality was is that we've already said the homes were small. The homes were were, were these, these spaces where they would have been standing shoulder to shoulder. There was no room for a paralytic to be lowered through the ceiling. There was no need for a complicated belay system. And there certainly was no piano or stage lighting. Instead, what the friends do is offensively disruptive. They recognize the need of their friend, and they have come to Jesus for a very specific reason. They want to see their friend walk again, and they're not going to let anything stop them from that experience. And so when the crowd doesn't let them through, what do they do? They climb on the roof, and they begin digging away at the ceiling of this small home that would have looked much more like this than a cavernous worship center. 
These beams that were laid across and they were caked with mud and straw in order to create some sort of uh, barrier from the moisture above. And they would tear away from this. And the moment they got up on that roof, no one was listening to Jesus anymore. The moment they got up on that roof, the attention was not on the Savior, was not on the rabbi, was not on the teacher. The attention was on what was going on above them as they heard the scratching, as, as dust and dirt and straw began to fall down on their head. These friends peel back one of these beams and immediately everyone can see them. Everyone knows what they're trying to do and yet they still have to wait as beam after beam is pulled back to create the space. As they reach down and they lower their friend below, there's no room for him. This is like a, a, a mosh pit, shoulder to shoulder, and he's just dropped right on the people in front of him. Jesus doesn't have any choice but to respond to the interruption. And in his grace, he does. And I'm so thankful that we worship a God who graciously responds to our interruptions that meets us in our place of unknowing. But I realize here in this moment, the friends were not concerned with what Jesus had to share. The friends were concerned with the physical needs that they had seen. And they wanted to exert their way and their will and in doing so, the sensitivity to their friend's physical hurt has left them indifferent to the greater picture of what Jesus is trying to do. Now, this isn't a, a perfect correlation, but I wonder if this is what our box-checking faith oftentimes looks like. We look at missions and we encounter it from a perspective of, of doing the right thing, of, of checking the box off, of, of fulfilling our moral obligations. And so we go on the short-term missions trip. We participate in, in, in a couple missional events at the church. We do all of the things and we check the box off and we move on. And I wonder if in this space Jesus sees us and his heart breaks because we're not capturing the bigger picture of transformation and restoration that he desires in his kingdom. I love how this miracle finishes up because Jesus, in a way only he can, addresses all three of these groups in the crowd. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. I want to pause here for a moment because I love this because I'm sure the friends are standing there thinking, oh no, actually, Jesus, that's not what we came for. Give me one more second. We, we want to see him healed. Right, But in this moment, Jesus invites them into the thing that they lack, the bigger picture of what he's trying to do, spiritually restore creation with creator. Then we see the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. To the Pharisees, he says, your sins are not to keep you from the presence of God. Instead, the presence of God is to free you from your sins. And he breaks down that barrier. So he says to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. The crowd that was so intent on their experience of Jesus is invited into an experience of transformation so far beyond what they could have possibly imagined. And again, Jesus tells them to turn and invite others into his presence. I love what Jesus does here. Because Jesus recognizes throughout the gospel message that physical provision is oftentimes an invitation to spiritual healing. Jesus feeds the hungry, gives water to the thirsty, clothes the naked, heals the sick. Why? To invite them into renewed relationship with their God. And so here at St. Mark's, we care about meeting physical needs. 
because we recognize that it opens doors and pathways. It breaks down barriers that allow others to have a taste of the God that we so desperately love. And over my past two years here, I don't know that there's a better demonstration of this posture of provision that opens doors than in the ministry and testimony of Vitaly Smolin, the founder of Open Door Foundation, who is serving in Ukraine and actively seeking to open doors with physical provision in order to provide an environment of spiritual healing. So let's take a moment here just to welcome Vitaly. The rest of our time together is going to be a chance to hear his story and have him share with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you, sir. All right, Vitaly. Well, hey, I have had a chance to um, get to know you over the past couple of years uh, and, and, and wear shirts from the Ukraine and see my boys running around in coats from the Ukraine and uh, eat delicious chocolate and hear your story. But, but not everyone else has had that privilege. So I just want to start off by um, asking you to just share with us a little bit uh, about your story, about your family, uh, and about what you, led you into the mission field in the first place. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pastor Pete. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here and on this beautiful Sunday. And, you know, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And um, uh, I just, two weeks ago, I was here, and I had to get on the plane and fly back. But I told Pastor Pete, you know, um, you guys have a special place in my heart. And if I could do it, I most definitely want to. And I grew up in a Christian family. I was born in Soviet Union. And my parents fled for freedom of religion uh, back in 91 to California. And I grew up in California. And, uh, you know, when you grew up, grow up here, you know, I, I looked at it and I said, church is for the old folks. And when I get old, I'll come around. But I'm going to chase an American dream and have, have fun. Uh, at 26, I was married with a beautiful wife and a four-year-old ch- baby girl. And I was on my deathbed in the hospital uh, saying, God, um, I don't know you. I know a lot about you. I have a lot of information. I went to a Sunday school. Know every Bible story there is. But there's two different things, knowing about God and knowing God. Mm. It, you know, one is information and one is transformation. Mm. And I said, God, I don't deserve anything, but if I could get a second chance in my life, I'll do whatever it takes to find you, to dedicate my life to you, and do whatever you tell me to do. I just don't want to die at 26. And, you know, um, when we are in the pickle... We're willing to say anything, do anything, just to get out of that pickle. But as soon as we get out of that pickle, we kind of forget the promises we made and things we did. In my case, I, I wasn't going to be that guy. And uh, I found God. I dedicated my life. Uh, we were going through divorce with my wife. We restored our marriage by God's grace. And uh, two years later, God called us to Ukraine. We quit our careers, sold everything we ever loved and cared, gave up everything, bought <coughs> one-way ticket to Ukraine, and landed on August 24th, 2009 in Ukraine and been there for 14 years, going on 15 years now. And Open Door Foundation is an organization that loves God and people. Mm. You know, there's, I, when I preach to in villages and simple um, places, I always say there's two commandments that we need to follow that Jesus gave us is love God and love people. Because if you love people, you will never cheat them, you will never hurt them, you will never mistreat them, you will never lie to them, you won't do any of that because you love them. And it's simply said as done because love is not feeling. Love is action. Mm. And that's what sometimes we confuse the two because we think love is a feeling. It has nothing to do with feelings. It's a choice we make to do something that you don't want to do and you sacrifice. And we've been fortunate enough to be able with Open Door Foundation to uh, we work with orphans. Uh, we work with elderly. We visit weekly to orphanages. We do summer camps. We have a dental mission. We have a medical mission. And the list goes on. I'm a chaplain, a military chaplain, law enforcement chaplain. And we've just been fortunate to serve and love God and love people in, in, in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, Vitaly. I love um, that your story is rooted in your own physical pain and, and how even in that moment of physical pain, you recognized uh, that, that deeper still was a need to experience spiritual transformation and, and spiritual restoration. And that led you on this path to, to be a conduit of, of, of that same kind of uh, redemption in our world. Uh, I remember 
um, having a chance to hear that, that very story a couple years ago. Uh, it was only probably six weeks after I came here um, to St. Mark's, and, and we were sitting in, uh, in the Yingles uh, dining room and sharing a meal together, and the war in Ukraine had not broken out at that point, and, and, and you were sharing just this story of your own uh, growth and transformation that led you to Ukraine um, and, and sharing testimonies of, of how God was using Open Door Foundation to do incredible things. And I remember the moment that you got a text message at dinner that night that told you that war had broken out uh, in, in your home country. Um, and, and I remember um, crying and praying together because there was the horrifying reality that, that your wife and children were still there. Um, and, 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 and we prayed together and we, and we prayed that, that your family would be uh, able to get out of, of Ukraine, to get to the border, to, to get to safety. Um, and, and I will admit that I remember in that moment thinking, uh, if I were in your shoes, the moment my family was safe was when I would wipe my hands clean of what was going on. I would say, hey, you know what, I'm going to pause. The, the ministry's open to our foundation. We're going we're gonna to take a break until the dust has settled. Um, and yet, shortly after your family got out, you went right back in. And, and not just at the border, right in the heart of the war zones. Um, tell me a little bit about what God was doing in your family, what God was doing in your heart that led you from this space of, of protection and comfort uh, to enter back into the fray. Um, it's a touchy subject. I pretty much get all emotional every time I talk about it. Um, even writing my notes, I was getting all emotional. Um, I told him to cry it out in front of the mirror before he got here. So... <laughs> so um, <laughs> You know, as a man, as a father, and as a husband, um, it's, it's, it's our obligation to protect our families. Mm -hmm. And uh, God has blessed me with amazing connections in Ukraine, and, I, and I'm tapped into military and all sorts of government agencies. And before I left on the 20th of February last year, I knew something was going to happen end of February, um, and we all kind of knew that was involved in the war. But we all knew it was going to be very local, east, kind of south part of Ukraine. Nothing major, nothing to worry about. Uh, but I'm, and we were prepared. I had a, a go bag and all our documents and everything in, in the hallway. Um, and I said, you know, if anything happens now, you get in the car and you drive. Um, but that's something you don't, you can't prepare for. You could never imagine and that text or that phone call came in. And I, 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 I was a wreck. Uh, because I blame myself that I left my family in the war zone. And um, this church has been there for me and my family. They stood up, they prayed. And miracles do happen when the church, the body of Christ, joins for a great cause. Because I told my wife, as soon as you cross the border, you get out to the first airport. I told her where it is. You park the car and you get on the first flight out of the country and I'll meet you here. And that was the plan. And then we would figure out what we're going to do. It took my wife over 20 hours to leave the country. And there was times that I had no idea what happened. Mm -hmm. And it takes me about two and a half, three hours to get out of the country right now. So you could imagine. And when she crossed the border, she called me. It was one of the most amazing times of my life because I knew it was kind of that pain and that worry was over. But at the same time, she was bawling on the phone. She couldn't stop crying. She said, babe, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here. You can't even imagine what has happened. Mm -hmm. More pain. You, I've seen more pain in the last 20 hours than I've seen my entire life. I packed my car with kids and women. My friend's car is packed with kids and women. And we try to get as many people as we can. I'm going to stay here. We're going to help them. These people need our help. And you stay in the U.S. and be the voice for the Ukrainian people. I stood on this stage on February 28th last year and asked for your help. And you guys responded in a way that I could never repay you or imagine. But that's what kept us in the country. And both of us knew at that time that God has used us, prepared us, equipped us for 14 years for the time as such as this. And that's why I lasted only here for four days. And I was on the plane going back to Warsaw, Poland. And the next day we drove into Ukraine. We left our kids 
in the hotel room and drove back right into Ukraine because it was a time-sensitive thing and we knew that God equipped us to be able to help the people and to give them hope because when all of our volunteers and people we work with found out that we were back in the country, they couldn't believe it because anybody that had any way to get out of it left that country as soon as they can. But God is good and with that, together we've been able to do things that we can't even imagine. We sheltered over 2,500 people. We evacuated 10,000s of people. We bought vans. We fueled up thousands of vans. We delivered over 100 pounds, 100,000 pounds of humanitarian aid. We bought uh, and rebuilt orphanages. We bought an elderly home. The list goes on, and I don't have time. We bought 20 containers and converted them to housing. It's unbelievable what God has done because we were obedient. And we were scared, don't give us wrong. But we were obedient and we knew that God is going to take care of what needs to be done. And we needed to be the hands and feet for Je of Jesus for the people of Ukraine. Wow. Man, I, I'm so struck by the way that God has, has woven so many parts of your story together. Uh, you know, you talk about this physical pain in the hospital that led you to recognize your spiritual need. And, and when you're spiritually restored, the next thing that happens is that, that you work to redeem your marriage and work to redeem that relationship. And it's because of that marriage now and the bravery of, of your wife, Natalia, as, as she exits out of, out of Ukraine, that you're drawn back in, that her heart breaks for um, the, the, the hurt and the pain of, of, of the folks in, in, in your, your home country and that invites you back into that. It's just so cool to see how God um, so often is working in our, in our lives and our story when, when we're not even cognizant of what's going on, when, when all we see is the mess around us, but what God sees is this beautiful tapestry. Um, you know, earlier today we were talking about um, how, how these spaces of brokenness, these spaces of, uh, of physical pain uh, and hurt oftentimes uh, create space uh, for the light of Christ to enter in uh, on the shoulders oftentimes of, of his, his faithful hands and feet. Um, can you tell us a little bit as we think about Ukraine over the past two years, I, I can't imagine there's anywhere that, that's under a cloud of, of darkness quite like that. Um, and yet I've heard from you story after story of, of spiritual transformation, of light, of hope, um, of grace. Uh, do you mind just sharing a, a few of those stories with, with us here today? Yeah, um, I, um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to see things that I wouldn't want my enemies to see or experience. And at the same time, I knew that God has called me to be there for this moment alone. And I was in, uh, involved with Samaritan Purse. I've been honored to work with them. And they're one of the most amazing organizations that love God and love people that I ever partner and work with. Mm -hmm. And they set up a clinic in Lviv on the train station. And that train station has seen more pain, I think, than any, anything you can even imagine. I was there translating and helping. And an elderly lady got rushed in. And some of you might have heard this story. I shared it before. She got rushed in because it took her three days to get to uh, the train station to be able to leave Ukraine. Usually what it takes about eight hours. And they were trying to do everything they can. You've got to remember, this is a clinic, not a hospital. And she was on the floor with the IV, and they were trying to throw everything they had at her to try to save her life. And I was the IV pole, and uh, the doctor said, Vitaly, squeeze the bag as hard as you can. And then the doctor looked up at me. I dropped the IV, got on my knees, grabbed her head, and I said, repeat after me. I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. Mm. I accept you as my personal savior. That was the last words that lady ever said. As hard as that is, but at the same time, I realized how amazing our God is. Mm. It has changed my life. What I realized, if we're willing to sacrifice our comfort and go out there and be the answer to a prayer, God will use you in a mighty way that you could never, ever even imagine. And what happened? God gave this lady a chance. I don't even know her name. In the last second of her life, to be with the king. 
And it's amazing. At the same time, it's so painful to see things like this. But that's how amazing our God is if we're willing to walk by faith, not by sight. Because like Pastor Pete said, I had a choice of running away. And st- not even run away. I had a choice of staying here and not going anywhere and just watch the news and pray. But God will use us in a mighty way if we can. At the same time, we've been able to do so many other things and see supernatural things happen. We run camps. And most people, uh, when they found out uh, that we were going to do summer camps regardless of the war, they said, these guys are pretty insane. Because, but I look at it, it's like, we don't have a clue what's going on. Like, we don't have an answer why people say, well, what's the, what, why is the war? Do they want land? I mean, the only answer I have is they just don't want Ukrainians to exist as a nation. And kids don't have a clue, and they're going through pain in, in a way and trauma that we can't even understand. Mm. And so we, Natalie's like, we're going to do camps regardless. We're going to love on these kids. We're going to bring love of Jesus to them. And we had a, a group of a couple hundred kids that came from East, and we work with some of the hardest kids in the country, we work with the orphans, with uh, traumatized kids, abused, single parents, underprivileged, uh, kids that have lost their parents in war. And we were just blown away. This group of kids never heard about Jesus. This was the first time they ever experienced the love of God and at the same time heard the gospel. And they, uh, uh, we try to make the camps fun. They didn't care about any of that. When we gifted them the Bibles, we couldn't unglue them from reading the Word. And they were children Bible, but they were so, like, just eating it up. And we were just blown away how God uses us in a way to be able to preach the gospel, to love on the people, and bring the good news. Because as far as I'm concerned, He's the hope giver. And the only hope that people need is Jesus, because He'll take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. So we're just privileged to be able to do things like that. That's amazing, Vitaly. I mean, it's hard enough to run a kid's camp in perfect conditions, let alone uh, in a war zone. But to see the testimony, I remember seeing so many of the pictures that you shared from that of just these smiling faces in the midst of, of, of horrifying brokenness and darkness. And, and I'm so encouraged just by your, your constant ability to pivot and just how do, how, do we, how do we do this in a way that invites people into uh, transformation? You know, you, you started a, a, a coat factory to, to provide coats for, uh, for those in, in, in the midst of the winter because they didn't have heat. You're, you're on the front lines. You're, you're serving food. You're doing just all of these things that, that, that it's, it's only God, right? And, uh, and, and I think today we talked about, um, you know, how often that there are these unintentional barriers that get built up with the ministry we're doing, uh, and yet God is faithful in overcoming those. And God is faithful uh, in, in inviting us through those barriers. How have you seen that happening in Ukraine and in, in the ministries of Open Door Foundation? Um, yeah, I mean, when the war broke out, there wasn't a single person in that country that wasn't terrified. Hmm. Um, because, you know, um, I remember growing up and my, my grandma and my grandpa, they went through World War II as kids. And, and then they would share the stories. And, you know, it's just a story. It doesn't get real. But you could see they were just super emotional and sometimes cry about talking about it. I was in this story now. Mm-hmm. And don't get me wrong, we were, I mean, we were scared. But God is so amazing. He has joined the church, the body of Christ in Ukraine, to overcome all the barriers that the devil has planned from the war, from the government, from any obstacle. We responded because Catholics, Orthodox, Protestant, Baptists, Pentecostals, you name it. We joined and became one body. For a great cause to save people and to bring hope of Jesus Christ and it was so phenomenal to see it didn't matter what the devil did the barriers physical or spiritual you know there was checkpoints it was impossible to move around but because we were chaplains and we had access to the government we had green light to go into places and evacuate and help and bring food and aid and when people are desperate and they know you don't have to be here They always ask, why? Why are you here? Like, everybody left. Why are you here? Why are you going against the traffic when everybody's leaving? You're going into the war zone. And it's just an opportunity to share. Because God loved me and said, I I, I need to love you. And it's the most easiest way to preach the gospel when you have just loved on somebody and did something. Maybe not even a big deal. You brought a meal or you gave clothes or you gave something to them. But to them, it's a life changer because they knew this wasn't natural. This wasn't supposed to be. Everybody that could have left, left. Wow. 
But that's what God does. It doesn't matter what barriers the devil will put. If you're obedient and you're willing to sacrifice, God will do supernatural things and protect in a way that you can't even imagine. Because I've been to places that, I mean, when everything underneath you, when the ground shakes underneath you, it's not normal. We're not made to understand that. But there's that little voice inside of you. I got you. Mm. You know that you know that you know you're in a place where God wants you to be. And you're bringing, bringing the glory together for, you know, for, for the kingdom. Wow. It's amazing. I mean, as I've been hearing you share today, but as I've heard you share over the years, I'm, I'm just so struck by, by the reality that in our comfort, it's so easy to complicate the gospel. And then I hear your story, and in the midst of crisis, you're just drawn into the simplicity of it. Uh, of this reality that when you don't have the privilege to complicate the gospel, man, the transformation is real. It's visible. The, the light breaks through in a, in a powerful way. And so I'm, I'm so grateful that you are, are one of those folks that's, that's breaking down barriers, that's opening the walls so that the, the light of Christ that's sitting right there on the other side can, can, can flood through into the darkness. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that just like our story today, there have been others that have come alongside you um, and, and, and been there in the trenches with you. Um, what would you say to this congregation uh, as they think about what it means to partner with you, come alongside you? Who have those friends been? What does that look like for you? Um, as, as Pastor Pete, you were, you were talking about the, the four friends that were lowering and, and making the chaos. Uh, you know, for us, because as I mentioned, when the war broke out, and that Sunday, February 28th, that pretty much will stay for the rest of my life, I was on this stage standing right here and just pleading for help. And you guys responded in the way that just blew us apart. Hmm. Because you are the four friends. If that guy didn't have the four friends, he wouldn't be healed. If I didn't have you guys, we wouldn't be able to do what we did. Thanks to Pastor Pete, to Mission Board, to Margaret, to Paul, to prayer warriors, and every single one of you that prayed, that helped, that gave. Because you were the ones that lowered us to Jesus. And we received the supernatural healings mentally, physically, spiritually, and gave us the wings to fly, to do unbelievable things. Together we have sheltered, we have fed the hungry, we have cried, we have evacuated, we have done things that I can't even imagine. Mm. But the only way that's possible because you guys cared. Enough to just bless us. I know you guys are praying for us. You don't have to even say that. The reason is because the only reason I exist or still alive because of prayers. And I'm just so honored and humbled to be able to call you friends and family. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for just walking alongside and lowering us to Jesus so he could do the supernatural. Thank you. Wow. Why don't you all stay standing here for a moment? Because I, I think moments like this are so humbling to me because uh, every time I get a text for you, from you, all I can think is like, I, I can't believe that, that our church gets to be a footnote in your story. Like, I, I know decades from now there will be books written about the faith of Open Door Foundation, about you and Natalia, and, and, and just the fact that God has invited us to be even a little part of that is, is just so humbling. Uh, but I, I want to invite us as, as, as you head back, you know, we're about to have our holidays here. It's, uh, you know, life is, 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 is chaotic, but also comfortable during uh, November and December. 
And, and I realized that that's not the reality for you. You're going back to um, a country that continues to, to face war, that is, is facing, you know, power blackouts and, and, and severe weather conditions. And, and we just want to lift you in prayer in this moment as you continue to faithfully serve God. So if you all would extend your hand um, as just a, a symbol of the Spirit of God um, that flows out from his body onto um, those that are serving him. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we just pray uh, right now for Vitaly and Natalia. Lord, for Open Door Foundation. Uh, Lord, we pray that they would uh, be overwhelmed by the presence of your spirit that rests upon their shoulders. Lord, we pray that, uh, that in the midst of the darkness, that, Lord, they would continue to have the energy and the courage to break down barriers of your restorative gospel. Lord, so that your light can shine in the darkest places. Lord, we pray that we as a community would partner with them in doing that. Even though we're here in the States, that, Lord, we would be pushing against those barriers, that we would be making way, that we would be opening doors for transformation in our own community, but also in Ukraine. And so, Lord, in this moment, we thank you that you are a God that deeply cares for his children. Lord, a God who shines brightly in the darkest of spaces and a God who has power to do remarkable things even with our humble offerings. Lord, may you go before us and make a way. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor.